There's a lot going on in the Ukraine-Russia front as the world's eyes are fixated on Russia's recent invasion of Ukraine. You're seeing the videos are surfacing on social media where uh, families are huddled in bomb shelters and fathers are saying goodbye to their children. And many around the world, including Israelis from occupied Palestine, are taking to the streets to condemn this intervention. So the U.S. media has given primetime coverage to this ongoing conflict for the past few days, more than the war on Yemen since 2015. So what does this invasion on Ukraine really mean, and how did we get here? From the Muslim journalists, I'm Zaina Wrights, and you're watching TMJ's The Breakdown. According to the Ukrainian Health Ministry, 198 civilians have been killed. Three among them are children and 1,115 are injured. It is said that more than 150,000 Ukrainians have fled the country since the attack by Moscow and more are continuing to flee along the borders of Poland. According to OVD Info, a Russian human rights group, 1,868 people have been detained at anti-war rallies across Russia and over 600,000 signatures have been collected by an anti-war online petition in Russia showing that many Russians are really not in favor of the ongoing conflict in it. Ukraine is a country that used to be part of the USSR, which it no longer is, but Russia has considered it for a while Russian territory. In 2014, a pro-Russian autocratic leader in Ukraine was ousted, and Russia began funding separatists in a portion of the Donbas region in the eastern side of Ukraine, making them more open to Russian influence. That same year, Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, got a job in Ukraine with the Burisma Holding Limited, an oil company that paid him $50,000 a month. This coup in 2014 is then a matter worth looking into. Now, let's be clear. This conflict has been brewing for eight years now, and this is not an easy thing to break down because the situation is more complex than many would have it seem. This means that for a large portion of that time, the people have lived in civil war, giving many different perspectives at how the situation is going to be looked at some even loyal to Russian influence or the revival of, of culture, including Putin. So, at TMJ's The Breakdown, we're looking at possibly having more of these videos that help you understand the situation better, especially as it unfolds. So, please be sure to give us a like and share this video if you like to see more content like this. A few days ago, the invasion began by Russia recognizing the independence of the Donetsk and the Luhansk regions and made this suddenly not a part of Ukraine anymore, and sent troops there saying that they are defending the people from Ukraine. Where the Russian separatists really are, and the area Russia claimed as independent, is farther out than where the separatists are. So there are troops between these two areas forming a border there. Let's talk about the invasion itself. Russia did not just invade from the separatist-controlled area in the provinces of Luhansk and Donetsk, but sent troops from Crimea, rocket attacks, missile strikes, and planes flying over Ukraine, so the aggression was a full-on invasion. It seems as though they do not want a prolonged occupation, but rather the country to quickly give in. Obliterating, obliterating the territory and taking over the fields is going to be what Russia is aiming for rather than having to occupy the territory there. Ukraine is a thousand times more defensible than Afghanistan in its mobilized troops, in its weapons, in its equipment, soldiers, and training capabilities. However, it is the people caught in between that are actually going to suffer, not to mention the global stock market. Russia's stocks as well have plummeted down 20 to 30 percent. Let's talk about the Minsk agreements, which were proposed diplomatic solutions comprised of two agreements. There's one in 2014 and the second one was in 2015, but the agreements were not followed. It didn't work because it would re have required a level of autonomy for the Donetsk and the Luhansk regions in favor of Russia to give them more control in the area. 
but the agreement said that both groups could, would pull out of the conflict region. Russia did not do this and in fact took over a whole town by sieging the city. So this conflict has been building up for over eight years now, until a couple months ago when Russia brought troops to the border, namely in Belarus and Crimea, which is an area of Ukraine that was annexed in the past. NATO is brought up a lot, but what exactly is NATO or the North Atlantic Treaty? NATO was founded in 1949 after the Cold War, starting with 12 members, and now it has 30 members, two are in North America and 28 in Europe. Its collective defense strategy means that an attack on one country is an attack on all of them. It makes up 57% of global military funding, and its main threat has always been Russia, but now it's also China. So let's talk a bit about NATO, which was very specific to mention that they were not going to let Ukraine in, and NATO was under no threat to let Ukraine in, and given the backdrop of how Russia was funding paramilitary groups there. The only way then to have really gone forward with this would have been to rely on the Minsk agreements, which would mean that Russia would have to concede by signing a treaty that Ukraine would never be part of NATO, which is not what Russia ultimately wanted. This is evident in Putin's speech when he speaks about how Lenin made a mistake to give Ukraine back and how nation states have a right to seize what they believe is theirs because simply that they're the same kind in their shared racial and ethnic makeup. Another reason Putin gave uh, for the uh, invasion is the demilitarizing of Ukraine so that they cannot use weapons against others, a similar likening to the U.S. and their reason to demilitarize Iraq, saying that they have WMDs and that they need to be uh, neutralized. Putin, in his speech on February 21st, which was translated by the Kremlin, has expressed that Ukraine's Western patrons may help Ukraine become a nuclear power, which is a very real threat to Russia, seeing that they're constantly pumping of arms into Ukraine and the presence of NATO's troops there. So, while NATO isn't really known for fighting defensive wars or upholding human rights, it is important to highlight what's going on in Ukraine for what it is, a full-on invasion by Russia. This, however, does not mean that NATO and U.S. allies did not ramp up for war, which we will break down in the next section as to how the media escalated war. The U.S. did send 3,000 troops to Poland and Romania to reinforce NATO's eastern borders and sent weapons worth $200 million to Ukraine and allowed other NATO countries to supply weapons to Ukraine like the U.K., which sent 2,000 missiles and 350 troops to Poland. The U.S.-led NATO bloc has said it would not be deploying any troops to Ukraine. However, they have launched a series of sanctions aimed at asphyxiating Russian economy. The United States is targeting Russia's banks, financial systems, and core infrastructure, which kicks out the banks from the U.S. financial system, bans trade with Americans, and freezes U.S. assets. The EU has imposed sanctions on Russia's financial, energy, and transport sectors. Other countries like Australia, Japan, can Canada, and others are imposing travel bans and targeting the elites of Russia. Meanwhile, China eases trade restrictions in Moscow. For the world, this could be devastating impact increased inflation and rising oil and grain prices. Worries about global supply disruptions have already pushed global oil prices above $100 per barrel for the first time since 2014. Interestingly, French Defense Minister Florence Parley said that we do not ship military equipment like humanitarian aid. There are very strict rules for such cargo, and we adhere to these rules. However, Germany recently reversed their policy of never sending weapons to conflict zones and will be sending 1,000 anti-tank weapons and 500 Stinger anti-aircraft defense systems to Ukraine. They've also authorized for the Netherlands to send Ukraine 400 rocket-propelled grenade launchers. It seems that then when uh, the sending of weapons and military aid to Ukraine's governments, this could mean either a longer, more drawn-out war 
or a greater escalation to a world war. According to a study conducted by Mint Press News, which looked at how major newspapers pushed for troop deployment in Ukraine, 88.9% of articles from the New York Times, Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal from January 7 to January 28 this year pushed for war with barely any mentions of NATO's role in the amping of tensions. Of course, then, there are stark differences on how Bush was portrayed after the invasion of Iraq versus how Putin is being portrayed. But let's also pivot to Russian-sponsored state media, which is not much better. Some of the outlets there are saying that there is no invasion or that the U.S. is invading Russia. So it's important to not make a general sweep about this issue by simply stating or bringing in U.S. imperialism, which is what we are seeing a lot of, as well with independent voices that are left-leaning. So let's talk about Biden and why it makes sense that the United States government and the mainstream media are in favor of war. Biden inherited the pandemic, promising to control the effects of the pandemic here at home which is not what really has happened, causing people to be angry and unlikely to vote for him uh, with workplace shortages, supply uh, chain shortages continuing to rise and the inflation is sky high, the prices for groceries and the lack of customer service are all very upsetting. The feds are raising rates to get inflation under control, and the government is not really in control of the situation. Even the experts that had called it uh, a transitory situation are not anymore. So some people believe that war is good for ratings because if people are angry, they are less likely to vote for you. And war brings the country together. Uh, Praise from mainstream media, which is a good reason as to why the U.S. has been escalating the situation there. Voices from Ukraine um, have also expressed many different perspectives about the situation. Some are in fear for their lives, and others are saying that the situation is overblown here in the United States. A post by CBS News has already expressed soaring prices are due to what is happening in Ukraine. The dangers of social media are that much of the information shared is unverified. It can technically bolster propaganda for each side, even if it is unknowingly. For example, when the invasion happened, lots of images and videos were being shared on social media, including a photo that happened to be of the Israeli airstrikes in Gaza from May 2021 and not the Russian attack on Ukraine. This was found out when a reverse image search led to the true origins of the photo, which is an Israeli raid and not what it was being depicted as. So voices that know of this pain too closely include the voices of Palestinians who say that they cannot even watch what is happening in Ukraine because it brings them the trauma um, that they know all too well. Um, I never wished seeing it happen to any other country, says Omar Ghaib from Gaza. The irony of the situation is how when it comes to U.S. allies, international law, human rights, and territorial integrity are the words being used, but quickly forget that the same situations are going on in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, Iraq, and Afghanistan. While it is important to let Ukraine stand alone in its struggle, we cannot ignore how closely all these struggles are tied in as well. Many Ukrainian Jews are said to be arriving in Israel to settle down in occupied Palestinian lands. According to Haaretz, around 400 Ukrainians are expected to move to Israel in these next two months. That means that around 200,000 Ukrainian Jews are eligible to move to occupied Palestine to become settlers there and continue to being a part of this unjust occupation. So when this is being described as a lone issue, that's also not entirely correct because a lot of these stories are intertwined. And not to mention, as the world's eyes were turned to Ukraine, Israel launched missiles for the fourth time this month in Damascus, Syria, on Thursday, February 24th, killing three soldiers. And U.S.-backed Saudi coalition launched 37 airstrikes in Yemen, committing 125 human rights violations and killing three civilians in Haja and al Baida. The ongoing attacks and besiegement of the Yemeni people since 2015 causing over 400,000 deaths and millions of people brought to famine. 
In this time, the U.S. has also launched an airstrike against Somalia on Tuesday. The New York Times and other outlets have framed this to be an attack on the Al-Shabaab forces in Dudublé. Which is troubling because Dudublé is actually a family clan name who are one of the first people to reside in this harsh region of Doha. This comes after Somalia's president and prime minister has declared a null and void deal uh, signed uh, by the Somali energy minister with the U.S. company called Coastline, uh, which is actually based uh, in Houston, Texas, exploring for oil and gas off its coast in the Horn of Africa. So the Bab al-Mandab and the Suez Canal are all important factors in how a proxy war is actually being waged uh, for control over the oil and resources there. So China is expanding into the horn. The U.S. is confronting China and Russia. um, and, And Russia is sending weapons there. And all three players are trying to gain influence and monopoly in the region. So 10% of all the global world trade passes through this area. And it is said that by 2050, uh, trade is expected to grow there from $881 billion to $4.7 trillion. Um, Al-Shabaab's weapons on ground are said to be Russian-made AK-47s. So known to be one of the poorest countries in Africa, this groundbreaking seismic programs uh, revealed that uh, Somalia is actually going to have the potential to become a significant oil and gas producing company. Um, Coming with uh, 48 hours of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, this issue seems to be a lot deeper than it truly is. Uh, It's tying a lot of these countries and their struggles together because they're actually uh, battlegrounds, proxy battlegrounds for the interests of the superpowers. So what is worth mentioning here is that the proxy war in Somalia for the last 15 years and Yemen for seven years has continued with little to no media coverage. But it is happening at the same time as the invasion on Ukraine with 24-7 coverage. At the end of the day, none of us are really going to know the truth. And we recognize our privilege sitting in our homes, uh, in our studios, um, and analyzing these plaguing issues. And our hearts and our minds are truly with the innocent people who are caught amidst the greed and ploys for power by tyrannical regimes be it ongoing, protracted wars, or fresh new ones.